1 uh, Corinthians 10, 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things <clears throat> as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as they, some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down and ate and drank and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of, some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Let us, nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all of these things happened to them as examples that they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the age has come. Therefore, let us who think he stands take heed, lest he falls. And here you have an interesting, uh, uh, there's a parallel in scripture, a generally accepted parallel in scripture, that the, the passing through the Red Sea was a type of the new birth, right? It was the type of, of, they went through the sea, it's a type of the new birth, and then going into the promised land, was a type of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are two experiences in Christianity. One is the new birth, right, where our spirits come alive, and the second is the infilling of the Holy Spirit, or, or the Holy Spirit upon us, actually. And so these are two different experiences. Here, the Bible tells us, and, and gives us an, ex you know, and it's to the Corinthian church, so we're, we're talking to New Testament people. And he's, he, the writer's saying, he says several times, actually, he says, if you look at this, it's, it says, uh, in verse 6, it says, Now these things became our example, right? Verse 7, And do not become idolaters as some of them were, right? The next verse, 8, Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, right? It goes, Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted, Verse 10, nor let us complain as some of them also complained. And it says, it finishes with, verse 11 says, that these happened to them as an example that they were written for us, right? In other words, we have this historical account and these examples because we're supposed to glean from them information that's supposed to help us, right? So verse 11 says, all of these things happened to them as an example that they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come therefore and therefore is always there for a reason right therefore let us who think he stands let those who think they stand take heed lest they fall in other words warning right it starts out with warning you know take a look at what happened to them you know read what happened to this group of people. Now he's talking about Moses, right? Because verse one tells us baptized into Moses, right? So we're talking about that group and that generation that, that we see in scripture. So we want to glean from that today. I want to take a look at it. And really the, the focus of the message is walking into the promises of God. And, and, and so that's sort of the global message today. But I want to go back and forth between New and Old Testament. I want to show you what these guys did and the warnings to us in the New Testament because I think uh, most uh, saints, most believers, don't understand God's promises. They don't understand how we uh, possess them and how we walk in them. Most Christians wait for God to do something. And most times God is waiting for Christians to do something. And, and so you, 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 you have to be able to make that switch in your head. Otherwise, you blame God for everything, right? So uh, if you would, go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 
verse 12. It says, beware lest there be in any of you. So who are we talking to? New Testament, right? Beware, what is that? A warning, right? It says, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through to the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if, and if is a conditional word, we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast till the end. In other words, there's a beginning and an end. You've got to hold it all the way through. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled. In other words, they heard the promise and they rebelled. <clears throat> Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom he, you know, uh, uh, God, capital H, was angry for 40 years, was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Because those who did not, what, obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Okay, so if we just go back through this, there's a, a bunch of key words. He's talking about a generation again, right? He's talking about uh, us, right? He's saying that if we're in Christ we, and we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, right? But as he's describing this generation that, that didn't go into the promised land, they died off in the wilderness. We're, we're, we're going to look at that. So, so they had a chance to go in to God's promises. They weren't able to because of unbelief. So the Bible calls it here, it calls it unbelief. It calls it rebellion. It, it calls sin. It calls departing from God, right? And, and so when you, when you look at departing, sin, you know, uh, rebellion, you know, you're on the other side of God, right? So these are clearly his people that did something wrong, right, that, that the Bible says they departed from him. They had a sin. They had sin in their life. This was sin, the sin of unbelief, right? And, and so uh, when we look at this, they could not enter into God's promise because they didn't have the faith to walk into it, even though it was there, right? Right? So, so now remember, the Bible tells us to look at them as an example, to take a look at what they did. Um, hold your, put a silk in because we're going to come back. Go to Numbers 13 and look at, let's look at what happened. If you've been coming for a while, it should be pretty familiar to you. Numbers chapter 13. And the, verse 1 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, for which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of the men who were heads of the children of Israel. So here it is, the promise, right? I'm giving you this land. Right? The commission from God. Go spy it out. Go take a peek. Go take a look. Send these qualified men to go in and take a look. Verse 23. So they came to the valley of Eskol, and there they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes that they carried between two of them on a pole. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. So now picture how big this, you know, this cluster of grapes is. I mean, it's not like in a mire, right? It's, these are like a big, you know, it took a pole and it took two guys, you know? So, so verse 24, so the place was called the Valley of Eskel because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after what? 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation 
of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh, they brought back word to them and, uh, and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They told them and said, we went into the land where you sent us and truly it flows with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are stronger. The cities are fortified, very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, right? The Amalekites dwell in the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Hold your finger there. So here they go, okay, God gave us a promise of this land. You sent us in to spy out the land. And guess what? It's just like you said. Everything that you said would be there, a land of milk and honey and fruit and, 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 and green grass, everything that you told us was going to be there, it was there. And then there's this word, nevertheless. Okay, circle it because uh, they're going to take a completely wrong turn here. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they're stronger, they're bigger, they're fortified, they're very large. There's giants in the land, right? So this is their report. Verse 30, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once <clears throat> and take what? Possession, for we are able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people who we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so were we in their sight. So all of the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Okay, so it's a lot of reading, but you know, here, here's what we have. Let's back up from it. Now, at this point, they had already gone through the Red Sea. They already went through the nine plagues. They already, the firstborn of Egypt died, right? I mean, uh, so they went through all of this, and, and here they are, they come up to the edge of this new promised land, right? And uh, so uh, God tells Joshua to, you know, to, to or, or uh, uh, Moses to send them in, right? So they go in and they come out and say, just as you said, and there's two opposing opinions, right? Same demographics, they were all slaves literally, you know, 50 days ago, right? It's 40 days later. Um, we, we see them have two opposing opinions. One says, it's just as you said, <clears throat> And we're not able to because of what we saw. We saw uh, armies with big guys, right? We've seen fortified cities, walls around them. We've seen, you know, that their weaponry, they, devour, they will devour us. This is their opinion, right? They end up weeping and crying all night because of this traumatic uh, uh, position that they find themselves in. They feel like they can't go in, right? So the other group, uh, you know, Joshua and Caleb, said we're well able to overcome them. We're able to go in. We're able to take it over. God's with us, right? So you have these two opposing points of view. Now let's back up from it and let's see what's true. What's true is on the other side, there is this promised land that God ultimately is going to give to them. It's there. It's his promise. It's something that he said. Now, you're going to hear this a couple times. When God speaks something or says something, take it to the bank. You don't have to. Once he says something, you can stand on it because it's going to happen. Okay? So once God said, I give you this land, and we'll see, we'll look at what Joshua encountered. You know, you're going to walk into the land, you're going to take the land, nobody's going to be able to stand against you, right? Uh, once that promise is laid out to God's people, okay, 
they have a decision that they can walk in it and possess it, or they don't. Old and New Testament, we're going to get there. But, but, but I want you to see that all this pain and anguish they felt because they wept all night and they worried about their children. If you keep reading verses, they're worried about everything. They're worried about this and they're worried about that and they're fearful about this and they're fearful about that. In the meantime, God has already, the God of the universe, creator of the universe, has already decreed, sanctioned, and given this land to these people. There is nothing that can stop that. Okay? <coughs> So, so they made the decision, and if you look down, look at verse 11 of chapter 14. It, uh, it says, then the Lord, um, you know, you can, verse 9 says, only do not rebel against the Lord. Moses is telling, don't fear, the land is ours. Do not fear, verse 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? Notice how the Lord takes a promise that we don't embrace and walk in. How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? Which they had many more, I mean, signs. They had great signs, right? And so what's God's thinking? How long are they gonna rebel? How long won't they believe me? How long won't they trust me? How long won't they, you know, believe what I say to them? How, what, do I, what else do I have to do, Moses? Now, what happens is God pronounces judgment here. And so all of these, anybody under 20 lived. Everybody over 20 died over the next 40 years. So over the next 40 years, if you were 21, you were dead in 40 years, right? So he killed off a generation, 40 years, okay? So now the new generation, the only couple of old guys were Caleb and Joshua. We don't know if there were others, but generally, by the time they got to that point, everybody was 60 and under, and most people were younger than that, right? And, and, and so Joshua ends up leading them into the promised land. Joshua ends up, you know, taking them and moving them into the promised land. But I want you to see the opportunity that was lost, because it's lost opportunity. It went, you know, they, they, didn't, it, 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 they, they didn't experience God's best even though God's promise and word was available to them. Right? So now go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Okay, verse 1 says, Therefore, therefore is there for a reason, right? Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have come short of it. So the Bible doesn't ask us to fear often. It says, therefore, <clears throat> since a promise remains of entering his rest, so we need to know what is that rest, right? You need to understand what is, because it's not, it's not our rest, it's his rest, of us entering his rest. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us, that's us New Testament saints, let us fear, let us have some fear, lest any of you should, should have come short of what? Of it. What's it? The promise. In other words, fear that there's any promise that's available to you <clears throat> that you come short of it and it doesn't live in your life, okay? He says, for indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Who's them? The, 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 the children of Israel, right? The gospel was preached to them as well as unto us. The gospel means good news. If you just write out gospel, it's good news. The good news was preached to them as well as unto us, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that, what, heard it. So, so now we see that both in the New Testament and the Old Testament, even though one is more physical and one is spiritual, right, we see that there's no difference 
in obtaining the promises of God. You have a promise, you either mix your faith with it and embrace it, or you don't. Right? So, so he's saying here, remember, he's talking in the New Testament, but he's, he's, he's saying, listen, they had the good news, and they didn't go in. They didn't enter because of unbelief. I'm telling you, New Testament saints, you should fear that any promise, that any drop of blood or action by Jesus Christ, I'm amplifying, right, that you don't have it in your life. That's not a part of your life. It's, in other words, you, you're not possessing it in your life because it's all given to us. You follow? So he goes on, let's read on because he continues. So verse 5, <clears throat> uh, actually verse 4, he says, And they had spoken in a certain place of the seventh day. In this way, God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. So we know that, right, from Genesis. It says, And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of what? Disobedience, right? He says, again, it designates a certain day, saying in David, today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, that means you, your ears are open to hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who enters his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent entering that rest, lest any of you fall according to the same example of disobedience. Okay, a lot of reading, but here, here's what it's saying. It's saying that, that God ordained from the beginning of the world, right, this day of rest. And, and the, the God's rest means that it's, there's a cease of work. On the seventh day, he rested. He didn't, he didn't do anything, okay? So he's saying, he goes back and he says, they could have gone in and entered his rest, but they didn't, okay? Which means the promised land was a type of rest, okay? So, so think about it. They had to go in. They had to fight armies, right? They had to overtake, but God calls that rest. But it says that Joshua didn't have perfect rest because he spoke of another day, and that's the day of Jesus Christ, right? And so now we see, again, we're taking both ends. We're taking the, New Testament, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we're saying there's a rest for the people of God. In the Old Testament, it was a type of Joshua going into the land that God had sanctioned and given him, walking in the promise that God had gave him, right? In the New Testament, it says Joshua didn't give them perfect rest. There's a perfect rest, which is in Jesus Christ. And here he goes, there is a rest for the people of God who cease from their works as God did from his. In other words, there's no exertion of, of physical strength because it's all spiritual. You follow? So it says that we should be diligent to enter that rest or that promise. So there's a warning that we can come short of it. There's a warning that we went and embrace it. There's a warning that we wouldn't be a part of it. There's a warning that we would give up on it. So when you look at it, it's up to us to possess that promise. In other words, if we find a promise in Scripture that is given to us in Jesus Christ, that promise is something that should live in your life and my life. If it doesn't, the defect is on our side of the fence. Okay, so go, go to, um, I was going to take you to Deuteronomy, but I'm going to skip that. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Actually, you need to go to Deuteronomy 11. I need to show you, uh, I need to show you a, a one particular scripture that plays into what we're going to talk about.
Deuteronomy 11. Because we want, we want to talk, I want you to understand, I want you to understand possessing the promise, I want you to understand the faith to walk in the promise, and what is God's rest in our life, okay? So, uh, Deuteronomy 11, verse 8. It says, Therefore you shall keep every commandment which I command you today. As you may be strong, go in and possess. Uh, there, he's going to say possess at least five or six times. The land and cross over to possess. And that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear to give to your fathers, to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land which you go and what? Possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from beginning of the year to the end of the year. Okay, so, so stop here for a second. So in Egypt, which is primarily flat, they would have to water from the Nile River by foot. So they would plant, right? And then they go truck water in and water by foot. So that's work, right? He said, when you go into this land, you're not going to have to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rain for you. I'm going to give you green, he goes on, I'm going to give you green grass. I, in other words, God's rest means God is on earth working with man to cause him to prosper, be protected, and walk in his promises. So for Joshua, while he had to go in and possess the land and take over the land, when they took it over, God's eyes were on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. God promised green grass. God promised a fruitful place. They didn't have to slave or work like they did before. God blessed them because they were walking in his promise. You guys see that? So they didn't have to convince God. They just had to obey God. And if they obeyed God, then they would have herds in the stall, they would have fruitfulness. They would have rain, the early rain, the latter rain. They would have green fields. Their enemies wouldn't be able to rise up against them. All of the protection that God could give them, right? Because they walked in by faith into his promise. You guys see that? So their rest was a type of physical rest, right? It's a type of, of, of you know, we go in and we're going to prosper, we go in and there's going to be an abundance of food. There's no famines. There's, there's no war. Nobody can come against us, right? Why? God's eyes are on the land. God's eyes are on the people. He gave them the land. So because he sanctioned it, because he spoke it, now he stands behind it and watches over it. Okay? And, 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 and so that I'm trying to, you know, to understand because God, we have promises in the New Testament that most of us are not living in. That most of us have not, you know, we, we, it's, like we, we, it's like taking half of the promised land, not all of it, right? So go to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 17, it says, Therefore, when I was planning this, did I, I did not do it lightly. Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me, there should be no yes, yes, or no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. Verse 19, For the Son of God... Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. 
for all of the promises of God in Jesus, in him, are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now, verse 20, look at what verse 20 says. It says, all of God's promises, in other words, all the promises of God the Father that are in Jesus are yes and in him, amen, which means any promise of God that Jesus bought by his death, burial, resurrection, by the spilling of his blood, any of those promises, there is always a yes from heaven and amen means so be it. So there's no negotiating. It's, it's, God has said any promise in Jesus, any single one that he bought by his blood and what he told his disciples and what he did, you're gonna see that we do greater works, right? What he did, all of those things, all of those promises, everything that he accomplished, it's not a maybe or a no or maybe, you know, it's always yes. Heaven's answer is yes, which means if there is a promise that is due you in Jesus Christ, you don't have to convince God in prayer to give it to you. You, near, you need to walk in an understanding of the promise, a revelation of the promise, and just make it a part of your life. Why? Because it's given to you. It's like going into the promised land and after Jericho's walls came down, they stopped there. This was good. We got a city. No, I'm giving you a country, right? And, and, and so God is endeavoring to switch our thinking from please do this for me, God, to I thank you for doing this for me, God. You guys see that? That's a, that's a paradigm shift. That's a, that's a complete shift in thinking. Because in one, you're insecure. Do I have it? Don't I have it? Should I walk in it or should I walk in it? But the truth, the answer is yes, so it's mine, God. I thank you for it, and I'm going to walk in it. I'm just going to believe that it is mine and walk in it. Go in and possess it, right? Take it over, right? So... What does that mean for us? Now, I'm going to go through a bunch of New Testament scriptures, but what it means to us is if you have an issue, find the scriptures that pertain to the issue that promise you the answer. Right? If you have an issue, find the scriptures that promise the answer to the issue. Right? And let me just, we'll take a short journey here. Go, go to uh, 1 John. I, I wasn't going to go here, but let's go here. 1 John chapter 5. In verse 12, it says, He who has the Son of life, he who, does, uh, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So what's he saying here? He's saying he who has the Son, a relationship with Jesus, has eternal life. He says these things I write to you who believe in his name. I'm writing this because you believe in the name of the Son so you have eternal life, right? He says now, verse 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we ask of him. So how do you have confidence in prayer? What's God's will? This is the confidence that we have in him, in God, that if we ask anything according to his will, we need to know what his will is, right? He hears us, and we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we ask of him. So what is, what is 2 Corinthians chapter 1? All the promises of God and Jesus are what? Yes and amen. So the promises are God's will. What was God's will in the promised land? Go in, I give it to you. It's yours right? 
We don't, you wouldn't have to sit here and negotiate about it. You start moving in, and I'm moving with you, right? And as I move with you, we're going to mo remove every obstacle because you're in my perfect will, right? So it's in the New Testament, it's the same thing. Okay, I accept that I am. Like, for instance, people, some people, let's, let's take some examples. This is really not going according to my notes, but it's good. <laughs> Let's take some examples. Let's take, uh, you, you have a sin in your life. I don't look at anybody. So you have a sin in your life, right? And you're dealing with it. And you finally, uh, you finally uh, get your arms around it and you, you stop, right? You, you stop, you walk in the light, you repent. You know it was wrong. For you to feel guilty about that sin, you know, even if it hurt people, for you to feel guilty about that sin is a type of unbelief. Why? Because you're saying the blood of Jesus didn't do enough for us. 1 John chapter 1 says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ covers our sins, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all righteousness. So you don't need to sit there because you're burdened down by, by your past and say, God, forgive me, God, forgive me. I already did forgive you, now move on, right? In fact, it's unbelief. It's just like they did. So where's the rest? The rest is that the blood of Jesus was enough. Right, do you guys see that? Do you, do you see how vital it is that these promises get deep down in us so that we're, we're because Satan tries to, to scare us and bring us fear away from the promise. He tries to paralyze us because every promise you walk, let me tell you something, those that will live godly will suffer persecution, right? So that's, that's a promise. That's a promise, right? But the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are always on the righteous to deliver them out of their affliction. So, you know, so we're, we're, we, need to, we need to look at Scripture and we need to understand just who we are. Because that, that's the problem. I think if Christianity, I'm not talking about the guys that have no relationship with Jesus. All right? The guys that go to church and, you know, they, 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 they don't know the Word of God. They can care less about obeying the Word of God. It's just they're a robot. They go to church, right? So I'm not talking about, I'm talking about them that have a relationship with him. You know, to have a relationship with him, you have to walk with him. And he has to walk with you, right? And, and so as you walk with him, you have to understand, we're not called to any fear or worry or concern or anxiety. We're not. It's a, it's a type of sin. It's a type of sin. You know, and, and while you feel the weight of the world and while you're, you're, you know, you're fighting and struggling with these things, you need to pull yourself up and you need to recount to yourself just who you are. Because the biggest problem in our circles is our identity. We don't identify as the Son of God. We don't identify, I mean, he could have made us just servants. But, he, but Jesus said, here's how you pray, our Father who art in heaven, right? In other words, he's a father to you now, right? And, and so there's a big difference between a master and a servant and a father, right? So our identities have to change, and with that change comes freedom. With that change of identity comes freedom. You know, people worry, hoard money, right? They hold on to money. You know, giving 20, they, t they take the pain off because, you know, where am I going to get my next 20, right? I mean, a, f a child of the living God who created the universe is not going to do that. They're going to be a giver, right? They're going to be a giver. They're not going to struggle. God loves a cheerful giver, right? Uh, it's, we talked about sin. You know, let's, uh, financial issues, Right? A lot of times God brings us into positions to, especially financially, to squeeze and change our hearts toward him. 
but you should always maintain your worship and praise of God no matter what's going on around you financially. Right? Why? Because if you don't, you don't believe he knows where you're at. Right? I mean, I struggle with this, right? It's, it's the pressure of debt, the pressure of things not going right, right? The pressure of not enough. All of that fear is wrapped up in us not knowing what to do. God never said, figure it out. Not once. You know, your homework, go find where he said, figure it out. All he said is, trust me. You work with your hands and trust me. And if you work with your hands, I'll bless you, right? So when, when, we, when we look at our, our walk with God, we really need to get back to where we're, we're supposed to be, but... But we, we you know it's really a matter of knowing what belongs to us. It's really a matter of, of, uh, of you know, like, like, let's just read this again. We're in 1 John, right? This is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we ask of him. So if you have an issue, picture, picture this as a court. If you have an issue... Make a brief of all the promises that God says about that issue. When you go to prayer, you tell him what he promised you. You tell him what he promised you. What are you doing? You're bringing your, your word before him. You're bringing the promise before him. You're telling him who you are. And you're telling him what he said. He cannot break his own word or promise. You guys see that? So anyway, go over to um, go over to First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians chapter two. Uh, let's start in verse 6. It says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. So, so he's saying here, we speak wisdom. He's saying we, me, Paul, the apostles, the teachers, and you, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. It was hidden from humanity. Uh, the gospel was hidden from humanity. Uh, the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if Satan knew what it would do to him, he wouldn't have crucified him, right? So this was hidden, and then it goes on to say, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So we have to look here. Where are the promises? The promises are the things, right? The wisdom of God and the things. So the things which God has prepared for those who love him are the promises of God, right? You can put promise in there. Are the promises of God which God promised to those that love him. It says, but God has revealed them. What has revealed them? Revealed the things of God. Revealed the promises of God to us through his spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. <clears throat> so we have this, the, the Spirit of God searching the plan and purposes of God, right? And knows all the promises of God, right? And so that Holy Spirit, verse 11, for what man knows the things of man except the Spirit, see small s? That's the human spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit, capital S, of God, okay? So, so uh, verse 12, 
So we have, we, we, now we have received not the spirit of the world, small s, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things or promises that have been freely given us by God. And so just stop there. We're going to read on one more verse, two more verses. So here it says that natural man cannot receive or understand the things of God, the promises of God. They're just, they're, they're, they're not absorbed in the human intellect, okay? They're, they, they're absorbed by faith. They're absorbed spiritually. So it says that our born-again spirit, where the wall is taken down, right? The division between God is taken away. Our human spirit now communes with God's Holy Spirit to reveal the things of God to us. What you're doing tonight is exactly that. What you're feeling, what you're gleaning, what you're receiving, what's rolling around in your heart, in your mind, it's the Holy Spirit that gave me a word as a teacher and I'm imparting that word to you. It's not your head, it's your heart that's absorbing that. Do you understand? So, so that's why when you, when you look at those that don't know God and you look at those that do know God, it looks like everybody's speaking a different language. They can't see what you see. They can't know what you know. They can't learn what you learn until their spirit's alive to God. You know, we don't feel it. You know, you don't always feel it, but that Holy Spirit is in you all the time and, and revealing to you all the time. So if we go, just go back and let's go through it one more time. Verse 11 says, no man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God, promises of God, except what? The spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, that's the new born again spirit, but the spirit, Holy Spirit from God, that we might know the promises, the things, that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he, what, know them, because they're spiritually discerned. So you, 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 there, there, there has to be, you have to get, in, when you get intimate with God in your prayer, you ever feel like, God, you know, God's there hearing me. God's speaking to me. God's, you know, that's spirit to spirit. God is a spirit, you know. He manifests things in the flesh, right, or in the, not in the flesh, but in the, in the world, right, through answered prayer and other things. But when you pray, your prayer goes to a spirit being who answers you spiritually first, and then it manifests physically, and so you got to learn that. You have to learn to, 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 to operate with the Spirit of God, right? And, and so we grow by positioning ourselves in church, right? Bible study, or at home on your couch. You position your spirit to receive from God. Every time you sit down and pick up your Bible at home, you should pray that God gives you revelation. Every time if you pray in tongues, you pray at home, you should pray that God's, it's not a one-way conversation. I want to know. Today I said, I want you to tell me what's going on. I want you to correct me if there's something wrong because I feel like I'm in mud up to my waist. So I'm asking you to speak to me. I'm asking you to tell me, you know, I'm asking you to reveal to me what you're trying to do in me so I can participate we can get this over, Right? What am I doing? I'm, I'm praying to God. I'm asking him for his will. What does his will say? Those that are the sons of God will be led by what? The spirit of God. So I'm asking his spirit to lead me. The Bible also says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely and abradeth not, but let him ask in faith. So God doesn't make fun of us. If we need wisdom, he said to ask for wisdom. What are those? Those are all promises. Those are, those are all promises that you can bring up to the throne 
and tell him, you said this, I didn't. You said if I needed wisdom, you give it to me. I need wisdom to make this decision. I need to know what to say, what to do, how to move forward, right? And so we, we rely on him for that. that and, and we're supposed to. He wants us to. So look, go over to uh, John chapter 14. I sort of got ahead of myself. I want to sh show some things on the Spirit of God. John 14. We're going to stay in the Gospel of John for three or four sections of Scripture. John 14, verse 15, it says, If you love me, conditional, keep my commandments. In other words, your proof of love for me is that you obey my word. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you for how long? Forever. The Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. So the first thing you need to understand about God's promises, and, and it happened immediately, uh, when Jesus came out of the grave uh, and he went you know, to heaven, he came back, he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Last time God breathed on anybody was the breath of life that came into Adam, right? So he breathed on and then, and then the Spirit of God entered them, and then anybody that believed their words, the Spirit of God entered into them. That's the new birth. Spirit of God cannot live inside a human being without that human being being righteous in the eyes of God. You see, we become, we become as righteous as God is in our spirit. Not our mind, not our body. But our spirit is as righteous as God. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit couldn't live in us. Right? So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So we are as righteous as God is in our spirit. Even though when you look in the mirror, you say, no way. Right? It's you are as righteous as God is. Otherwise, the spirit of God couldn't live in you. Right? Right? which means that at every twist and every turn and every roll of your bed and every word of complaint, the Holy Spirit is there with you. You know, it, it, it'd, be, it'd behoove us to say less and, and, and cry less and just trust God, right? Because the Spirit of God is there. So that's the first promise that I, I think, because once, once you know God's with you, once you know God's with you, there's nothing that can come against you that can win the battle. Now, will we, have, will we fall? Will we be tested? Will we be tempted? I mean, S Saturday we're teaching. Saturday is the, the name of the message is Satan's aggression. Uh, you know, what Satan can do to us. Because he, he can do quite a bit. Even though we're talking about all of this, there's a lot that he can do and there's a lot that we can stop him from doing. And there's a lot that God allows him to do. He allowed him to buffet Paul, right? And, and, and so we need, we need to look at that. We need to understand it because at the end of the day, when you glorify God, even though you're in a painful spot, it reveals to God in the spirit realm, elect angels and fallen angels, that you truly love him and believe in him. It's easy to worship and jump up and down and sing when everything's easy and breezy. But when you have a battle and you're in that battle and you're, you know, you're sweating blood, right? And, and you're, you're trusting God and you're trying to fend off the dark thoughts in that. When you can glorify and worship God in that place, you're really validating the true God. God gets more glory out of that than just about anything. What did he do with Job? Behold my servant Job. There's none like him in the earth an upright man, a man of integrity. Have you considered going at him? What was it? A challenge. It was a challenge. At the end of the day, what, what would the challenge do? 
it would show Satan God's manifold wisdom. It would show Satan that one who loves me isn't going to be uh, persuaded by things you can throw at him, right? So it changes where we, it changes where we're at. Because I'm going to tell you, the more problems you have, the greater threat you are to Satan's kingdom. I mean, just back up from it. Where does he want to spend his time? Not on somebody that's, you know, let's, let's go to church to get it out of the way. You know, let's go to church to get it out of the way. Let's go Saturday night so we can have all Sunday. To, you never get out of the way of visiting God in his house, right? I mean, you have to be sober enough to understand what you're doing, right? You know, people say that. I'm not condemning you if you say that. But when you think about it, we're, we go to God's house as a family to receive from God, right? And so it's not getting it out of the way. So if you said that, just repent tonight. Get rid of it. Uh, also here, if you look up um, at chapter 14 and verse 12, uh, it says, verse 12 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now it says there that we do greater works than, than, than Jesus, right? It says that God would give us anything that we ask. Now you have to temper that, right? Because the temperance of it is if you ask according to his will, right? <laughs> if you ask, you know, I mean, you know, you, you can ask for worldly things all day long. The first and primary thing for answered prayer is ministering to yourself, right? God minister to me or me ministering to others. That's where God answers prayers, you know, all prayers. If you're asking for, you know, three-car garage, I don't know if you're going to get it or not, right? I mean, because why? Because God has this plan, and, and this plan um, has to go off according to him. You know, that's why a lot of the charismatic churches got it wrong by saying they could demand God's hand. You know, I mean, where do you get that? We're not smart enough to know anything anyway. Why would we have that power, right? And so we, we, we have to learn. Remember, if you, if you can position yourself in prayer for something God has promised you, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Is meeting needs a promise? Yes, yes. Is abundant wealth a promise? No. More than enough, right? So, so some are called to and some aren't called to. And so when you strive for something you're not called to, the Bible says you what? You suffer. Mm -hmm. You suffer. Because why? You're, you, you always see yourself in a place where you're lacking because you want more, right? The love of money is the root of all evil. It's not money. It's the love of it that's the root, right? And so we need to go, we need to understand because one of the biggest things you can do is understand that God knows right where you're at and he has a plan for your next step. Right? He has a plan for your next step. So you may be trying to walk left and he needs you to walk right, so he's going to keep pushing on you until you get it right. Right? But he has a plan for each one of us. It's called his perfect will. The Bible says that we can do the good, acceptable, or what? Perfect will of God. Amen? So let's look at a, another, uh, John 16. And this is some of my favorite scripture here. <clears throat> oh, it's five after. All right, let's just read this one and then we'll, okay? Sorry. John 16, verse 19 says, Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Most surely I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow, because her hour has come. 
But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought into the world, right? Therefore, therefore is a reason, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice and no one will take from you. And in that day, what day? The day that he returns, the day that their joy is full, right? In that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken to you in figurative language or parables, right? But the time has come when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I'll tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, again, after his resurrection, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I've come forth from God. I came forth from the Father, have come into the world, and again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Now, this, this to me, you know, this access to God is extraordinary that we can go to his presence and he hears us. Jesus said, don't even ask me. Praying to Jesus is not the right form of prayer. Praying to God the Father in Jesus' name is, right? So Jesus bought this. This promise is that God will hear you directly. God will hear your prayers directly. There's no, you don't need inter, inter, somebody to intercede for you. Although, at times we need intercession and you should intercede every day for other people. But in all reality, you know, what, what, is they, what do they do in the Old Testament? They go through a man to get to God. Denominations here, I grew up in, in the Catholic Church. Catholic Church still, you go through a man to get to God. It's wrong, okay? We have access to God. And so we go direct, okay? So putting a man in the way says you're not good enough. Remember the self-esteem issue? Remember your identity? You have to know who you are. By putting a man between you and God, you're saying you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not forgiven enough. You can go to God directly, right? So anyway, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we bring up some prayer requests. Uh, we pray for Tom, who had uh, two strokes, 30 seizures, now blind in a coma. Father, we extend our faith toward Tom, Lord. We pray you do a miracle. We pray your healing power saturate his body, Father. Bring him out of a coma, Father. Give him sight back. Do a miracle, Lord. Give us a testimony. Give us, give us a, a, a powerful testimony of a, of, a, of a situation that looks so bad, Father, that no one can turn it around but you. Father, we pray for Tom for, for healing. We pray for Kim. She lost her job after 16 years. Lord, we pray that you open a door immediately for a new position, a new job, a new place. Father, we pray for Megan, who's looking for a job. We pray for, Father, a door to open, Father, to a perfect job. Uh, we, Nick has purchased of a new home. We pray that it goes without complication or side effects, Lord, and it closes. Pray for Ray, who's looking for a good uh, report on chest x-ray, lung, heart, etc. Father, we pray for Ray. Father, we pray that you would, Father, uh, before even the tests are done, you would touch the physical body. Cause, Father, these, these reports, Father, to be, Father, uh, that you're healthy. Father, we pray, we give you glory and praise and honor. We love you so much. We're so thankful to you. Lord, we thank you for today's message. We pray it would not soon leave our hearts and minds, but Lord, this message would be burned to our hearts and minds and your spirit would continue to bring it up as we go through the week. In fact, we pray that you would open doors for us to share this message to others, Lord, that we could take this message and share it into other lives. Lord, we give you glory and praise and honor in Jesus' name, amen. So Saturday, 10 o'clock at Victory, I'll, I'll teach this Saturday. So see you there. Be blessed.